My son the fanatic. What do parents do if they believe their children are taking the wrong direction in life? What do children say when they discover their parents are all too human? Can they ever reconcile their differences, especially when the world around them is pulling hard in different directions? Surreptitiously, the father began going into his son's bedroom. He would sit there for hours, rousing himself only to see clues. What bewildered him was that Ali was getting tidier. Instead of the usual tangle of clothes, books, cricket bats, video games, the room was becoming neat and ordered. Spaces began appearing where before there had been only mess. Initially, Pavez had been pleased. His son was outgrowing his teenage attitudes. But one day, beside the dustbin, Pavez found a torn bag which contained not only old toys, but computer discs, videotapes, new books, and fashionable clothes the boy had bought just a few months before. Also, without explanation, Ali had parted from the English girlfriend who used to come often to the house. His old friends had stopped ringing. For reasons he didn't himself understand, Pavez wasn't able to bring up the subject of Ali's unusual behaviour. He was aware that he had become slightly afraid of his son, who alongside his silences was developing a sharp tongue. One remark Pavez did make, you don't play your guitar anymore, elicited the mysterious but conclusive reply, there are more important things to be done. Yet Parvez felt his son's eccentricity as an injustice. He had always been aware of the pitfalls which other men's sons had fallen into in England, and so for Ali he had worked long hours and spent a lot of money paying for his education as an accountant. He had bought him good suits, all the books he required, and a computer. And now the boy was throwing his possessions out. The TV, video and sound system followed the guitar. Soon the room was practically bare. Even the unhappy walls bore marks where Ali's pictures had been removed. Parvez couldn't sleep. He went more to the whiskey bottle even when he was at work. He realised it was imperative to discuss the matter with someone sympathetic. Parvez had been a taxi driver for 20 years. Half the time he'd worked for the same firm. Like him, most of the other drivers were Punjabis. They preferred to work at night. The roads were clearer and the money better. They slept during the day, avoiding their wives. Together they led almost a boy's lives in the cabbie's office, playing cards and practical jokes, exchanging lewd stories, eating together and discussing politics and their problems. But Pavez had been unable to bring the subject up with his friends. He was too ashamed. And he was afraid, too, that they would blame him for the wrong turning his boy had taken, just as he had blamed other fathers whose sons had taken to running around with bad girls, truanting from school and joining gangs. For years, Parvez had boasted to the other men about how Ali excelled at cricket, swimming and football, and how attentive a scholar he was, getting straight A's in most subjects. Was it asking too much for Ali to get a good job now, marry the right girl and start a family? Once this happened, Pavez would be happy. His dreams of doing well in England would have come true. Where had he gone wrong? For one night, sitting in the taxi office on busted chairs with his two closest friends, watching a Sylvester Stallone film, he broke his silence. I can't understand it, he burst out. Everything is going from his room, and I can't, can't talk to him anymore. We were not father and son, we were brothers. Why has he gone? Why is he torturing me? And Parvez put his hands in, head in his hands. Even as he poured out his account, the men shook their heads and gave one another knowing glances. From the grave looks, Parvez realized they understood the situation. Tell me what is happening, he demanded. The reply was almost triumphant. They had guessed something was going wrong. Now it was clear. Ali was taking drugs and selling his possessions to pay for them. That was why his bedroom was empty. What must I do then? Pavez's friends instructed him to watch Ali scrupulously, and then be severe with him before the boy went mad, overdosed or murdered someone. Pavez staggered out into the early morning air, terrified they were right. His boy, the adric drug had a killer. To his relief, he found Bettina sitting in his car. 
Usually the last customers of the night were local brasses or prostitutes. The taxi drivers knew them well, often driving them to liaisons. At the end of the girls' shifts, the men would ferry them home, though sometimes the women would join them for a drinking session in the office. Occasionally, the drivers would go with the girls. A ride in exchange for a ride, it was called. Bettina had known Pavès for three years. She lived outside the town, and on the long drive home, where she sat not in the passenger seat but beside him, Pavès had talked to her about his lives and hopes, just as she talked about hers. They saw each other most nights. He could talk to her about things he'd never be able to discuss with his own wife. Bettina, in turn, always reported on her night's activities. He liked to know where she was and with whom. Once she has rescued her from a violent client, and since then they had come to care for one another. Though Bettina had never met the boy, she heard about Ali continually. That late night, when he told Bettina that he suspected Ali was on drugs, she judged neither the boy nor his father, but became businesslike and told him what to watch for. It's all in the eyes, she said. They might be bloodshot, the pupils might be, eye, might be dilated, he might look tired. He could, liable, he could be liable to sweats or sudden mood changes, okay? Pavès began his vigil gratefully. Now he knew what the problem might be, he felt better. And surely, he figured things couldn't have gone too far. With Bettina's help, he would soon sort it out. He watched each mouthful the boy took. He sat beside him at every opportunity and looked into his eyes. When he could, he took the boy's hand, checking his temperature. If the boy wasn't at home, Pavis was active, looking under the carpet, in his drawers, behind the empty wardrobe, sniffing, inspecting, probing. He knew what to look for. Bettina had drawn pictures of capsules, syringes, pills, powders, rocks. Every night she waited to hear news of what he'd witnessed. After a few days of constant observation, Pavès was able to report that although the boy had given up sports, he seemed healthy with clear eyes. He didn't, as his father expected, flinch guiltily from his gaze. In fact, the boy's mood was alert and steady in it this sense. As well as being sullen, he was very watchful. He returned his father's long looks with more than a hint of criticism, of reproach even. So much so that Pavès began to feel it was he who was in the wrong and not the boy. And there's nothing else physically different, Bettina asked. No, Pavès thought for a moment, for he is growing a beard. One night, after sitting with Bettina in an all-night coffee shop, Pavès came home particularly late. Reluctantly, he and Bettina had abandoned their only explanation, the drug theory for Pavès had found nothing resembling any drugs in Ali's room. Besides, Ali wasn't selling his belongings. He threw them out, gave them away or donated them to charity shops. Standing in the hall, Pavès heard his boy's alarm clock go off. Pavès hurried into his bedroom, where his wife was still awake, sewing in bed. He ordered her to sit down and keep quiet, though she had neither stood up nor said a word. From this post, and with her watching him curiously, he observed his son through the crack in the door. The boy went into the bathroom to wash. When he returned to his room, Pavès sprang across the hall and set his ear at Ali's door. A muttering sound came from within. Pavès was puzzled, but relieved. Once this clue had been established, Pavès watched him at other times. The boy was praying. Without fail, when he was at home, he prayed five times a day. Pavès had grown up in Lahore, where all the boys had been taught the Qur'an. To stop him falling asleep when he studied, the Mulvi had attached a piece of string to the ceiling and tied it to Pavès's hair, so that, that if his head fell forward, he would instantly awake. After this indignity, Pavès had avoided all religions. Not that the other taxi drivers had borne respect. In fact, they made jokes about the local mullahs walking around with their caps and beards, thinking they could tell people how to live while their eyes roved over the boys and girls in their care. Pavès described to Bettina what he had discovered. He informed the men in the t taxi office. The friends who had been so curious before now became oddly silent. They could hardly condemn the boy for his devotions. 
Pavez decided to take a night off and go out with the boy. He, they could talk things over. He wanted to hear how things were going at college. He wanted to tell him stories about their family in Pakistan. More than anything, he yearned to understand how Ali had discovered the spiritual dimension as Bettina described it. To Pavez's surprise, the boy refused to accompany him. He claimed he had an appointment. Pavez had to insist that no appointment could be more important than that of a son with his father. The next day, Pavez went immediately to the street where Bettina stood in the rain, wearing high heels, a short skirt, and a long mac on top, which he would open, hopefully, at passing cars. Get in, get in, he said. They drove out across the moors and parked at the spot where on better days, with the view unimpeded for many miles by nothing but wild deer and horses, they'd lie back with their eyes half closed, saying, This is the life. This time, Pavez was trembling. Bettina put her arms around him. What's happened? I've just had the worst experience of my life. As Bettina rubbed his head, Pavez told her that the previous evening he and Ali had gone to a restaurant. As they studied the menu, the waiter, who Pavez knew, brought him his usual whiskey and water. Pavez had been so nervous, he had even prepared a question. He was going to ask Ali if he was worried about his imminent exams. But first, wanting to relax, he loosened his tie, crunched a papadam, and took a long drink. Before Pavez could speak, Ali made a face. Don't you know it's wrong to drink alcohol, he said. He spoke to me very harshly, Pavez told Bettina. I was about to castigate the boy for being insolent, but managed to control myself. 